Today we're continuing our study through the Sermon on the Mount. We'll be looking at Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 48. And throughout the Sermon on the Mount, what we've seen so far is that Jesus calls us, uh, is calling us to be righteous in every area of our lives. Now, perhaps there's no greater test of righteousness than when we face opposition. And that's what we're talking about today. And whether that opposition is legitimate or not. We've all been in situations where someone was against us, and how we respond to opposition ought to be in line with who we are. And, and Matthew 5, 38-48 shows us that we're called to righteous living in dealing with opposition, where we choose grace over retaliation and love over hate. So Matthew 5, 38-48 reads, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your court coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore you are to be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect." Jesus here in this passage addresses two Old Testament interpretations, or I should say, two interpretations of Old Testament ideas, and he addresses their escalating nature. The, the first uh, Old Testament interpretation is found in verse 38. You have heard it said, uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now there are three Old Testament passages from which this comes. The first is found in Exodus 22, 23 through 25, where it reads, if men struggle with each other, and strike a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet there is no injury, he shall surely be fined as the woman's husband may demand of him, and he shall pay as the judges decide. But if there is any further injury, then you shall appoint as a penalty life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, and bruise for bruise. The second Old Testament passage is found in Leviticus chapter 24, verses 17 through 22. If a man takes the life of any human being, he shall surely be put to death. The one who takes the life of an animal shall make it good life for life. If a man injures his neighbor just as uh, he has done, so it shall be done to him, fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, just as he has injured a man, so it shall be inflicted on him. Thus the one who kills an animal shall make it good, but the one who kills a man shall be put to death. There shall be one standard for you. It shall be for the stranger as well as the native, for I am the Lord your God. And the third passage is found in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 21. Any single witness shall not rise, a single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. If a malicious witness rises up against a man to accuse him of wrongdoing, then both the men who have the dispute shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who will be in office in those days. The judges shall investigate thoroughly, and if the witness is a false witness and he has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him just as he had intended to do to his brother." Thus you shall purge the evil from among you. The rest will hear and be afraid, and will never again do such an evil thing among you. Thus you shall not, thus you shall not show pity. Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Now, by Jesus' time, this idea of an eye for eye and a tooth for a tooth became the validation for revenge and retaliation. But the context for these passages is that of a sentencing in a court setting. These passages set the standards for legal punishment so that sentencing wouldn't be too lenient or too harsh. Thus, cutting off someone's hand for stealing a loaf of bread would be too harsh, and letting a murderer get off with an exceedingly light sentence would be too lenient. The Old Testament protected against this. And using these passages to endorse revenge and retaliation rips them from their context. 
But that was exactly the, what the popular understanding was in Jesus' day. And unfortunately, it's also the common understanding in our day as well. The seeking of revenge is prohibited by the Old Testament, though. Leviticus 19.18, which we'll look at later, condemns revenge against one's brother. And throughout the Bible, vengeance is something that belongs to the Lord and not to his people. Indeed, Paul writes in Romans 12.19, Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So as God's people, we're not to live by seeking tit for tat. We're not to be about revenge. And retaliation is not to be a part of who we are. We are called to a greater righteousness. And what does this greater righteousness look like when we face opposition, when, when opposition comes up against us, when we, and we want to retaliate? Jesus tells us that we are to not, we're not to resist an evil person. The idea for our resist here is to go after the other person, and that is not our way. When we're attacked, our response is not to be a counterattack. It is instead to be a response of grace. And Jesus shows us four ways to apply this idea of non-resistance in verses 39 through 42. First, one you're all familiar with, turn the other cheek. Jesus says, whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Most people are right-handed. So if you're going to slap someone who is facing you, you would slap them on their left cheek. This means that the slap Jesus is talking about is a backhanded slap more painful, and definitely more insulting. Our response is not to launch ourselves at the other person, but something that strikes against, strikes out against our sense of pride and, and even common sense. We're to offer the other, for the other person to slap our left cheek, a less powerful blow. Now, there's something that we need to be aware of in discussing all of this. Now, Jesus here is not talking about uh, defending or, or not defending ourselves. He's not going against self-defense. The person slapping us in this passage isn't trying to beat us up. They're not seeking to kill or seriously injure us. What's going on here is someone is insulting us, and though it might be a physically painful insult to be backhanded, the pain will go away. We're not to carry on aggression when we can attempt to defuse the situation. However, this doesn't mean that we stand idly by and not speak up against injustice. Jesus himself was slapped and pointed out the injustice that was being done to him. He didn't retaliate. He didn't escalate the situation. We are to be like that. We are to seek peace and not vengeance. Now, the second application that Jesus makes in this here is in a legal setting found in verse 40. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Now, the idea here is that someone is wanting to sue you for a legitimate reason. Frivolous lawsuits weren't as common in ancient Israel as they are today. Suits were heard, heard by a court of three men, none of whom were professional judges. One was appointed by the suing party, one appointed by the defendant, and the third was chosen by those two judges and then approved of by the plaintiff and the defendant. None could be friends, relatives, or enemies. A frivolous lawsuit would not have gotten very far in that system. So the suit that Jesus speaks of here he is a legitimate case. The shirt was the garment that was worn next to the body, extending from the shoulders down to about the ankles, and was usually made of wool or linen. And some could actually be quite expensive. The coat was the garment worn over the shirt. It was used to protect against the elements and often used as a blanket at night. And it could be used for collateral, but it had to be returned before nightfall. The Old Testament prescription was extended into Jewish law such that you could sue someone for their shirt, but not for their cloak. So let's say that you owe someone some money. You missed the deadline and you can't pay it back. The person who owed you the money could sue you for your nice linen shirt as payment, but he could not sue you for your cloak. It is in this setting with this idea that Jesus tells his disciples, and us by extension, let him take your cloak too. We are to go beyond what is required of us in order to restore the relationship, to make reconciliation. And we talked about this back over in verse 25. You can go back to that video. The third application is found in verse 41. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Now in Jesus' day, 
the Roman army could impress into service locals and their animals to carry burdens. Now, in many places, this was abused, and such abuses were decried by the Roman Senate, and especially those emperors who felt that such a right was their own to order. A simple soldier did not have such a right in their mind. Nevertheless, the practice continued. Uh, in Israel, it was an especially hated practice. Sometimes locals were forced to carry burdens on the Sabbath day. The Roman occupiers didn't, certainly did not, were not out to make any friends in this situation. Now, usually such conscription was for a certain distance, the most likely being a one Roman mile or about a thousand paces. And now if you're carrying a heavy burden, a thousand paces is plenty enough. But for followers of Jesus, we are to extend grace. We are to go the second mile. We are to do more, more than is required of us. We are to be people who put our own comfort aside to help other people. The fourth application is found in verse 42. Give to him who asks you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. To ask money of someone at this point in time was a humiliating thing. You had to shame yourself. It was a shame to ask for financial help. Some preferred death over such humiliation. And it was doubtful that someone would ask you for help if they re didn't really need it. And especially if that person was an enemy. Now the rabbis taught that you shouldn't give to an enemy. And you should only give to friends, to those who are good and righteous. Otherwise, your enemy might use what you have given him to hurt you. Now, Jesus here flips that on its head. I just lost my place. Flips that on its head. There we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> we are to be generous without partiality. If we can help, we ought to help. Now, whether we like the person or not, whether they like us or not, uh, as Paul writes in Romans 5.10, for if while we were sinners, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now, this doesn't mean that we're to be reckless in our giving. Indeed, nowhere are we commanded to help those who are just plain lazy or irresponsible. In 1 Thessalonians 5.14, Paul writes to the Thessalonians to admonish the unruly, the undisciplined, the irresponsible. And in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, he instructs that if anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. Now, taking such verses into consideration, our generosity is to be impartial to friends, our enemies. But we're to be careful to discourage laziness and irresponsibility. We balance generosity with responsibility. It should be impartial, though. When we're insulted or inconvenienced, we're to respond not with retaliation, not with anger, not with hate, but with grace. But what about when things progress beyond just these inconveniences, just these insults? What about when it gets really serious? Jesus tells us about this in verses 43 through 48. He quotes the Old Testament teaching, and I should say the common interpretation of that. Verse 43, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Loving your neighbor is scriptural. In fact, later Jesus will say that this is the fulfillment of the second section of the Ten Commandments. And Leviticus 19, 17 through 18 speaks of this. It reads, You shall not hate your fellow countrymen in your heart. You may surely reprove your neighbor, but you shall not incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So, while loving your neighbor is biblical, nowhere, nowhere, in the Old Testament, is there a command to hate your enemies? But this became a common understanding in Jesus' day. The neighbor was your fellow Jew. Everyone else was an enemy. And if you're commanded to love your neighbor, by default, you're expected to hate your enemy, right? Well, the inverse of the command is just as much of a command, isn't it? No, it's not. Simply put, no, it's not. In fact, the Bible pointed out that the people of Israel were to treat the stranger among them as one of their own. Jesus breaks the common interpretation to get back to the spirit of the law. 
And at a later time, Jesus would redefine neighbor for them with the parable of the Good Samaritan. But here in this passage, he takes the nationalistic understanding of neighbor and enemy and makes it personal. And he tells us how we are to respond in verse 44. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Instead of responding with hate and anger and re retaliation, our response is not what the world expects. Love, not the emotion, but the willful choosing to consider the welfare of someone else over yourself is to be our response to an enemy. Jesus is the example for us. While we were yet sinners, enemies of God, he loved us. Jesus came to die for us who were opposed to God, haters of God in action, if not in mind. He died that we might have life, that we might be reconciled to God, that we might have peace. This is the gospel. This is the good news of Jesus. That though we were enemies, he loved us enough to die for us that we might be made right with God. And he rose from the dead to offer us eternal life with God. And just as Jesus did, we are to love our enemies. This means that we are to consider their welfare. In Romans 12, 20, Paul quotes the Old Testament, But if your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. And he continued there in verse 21, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The next thing that we respond there is that we're also to pray for those who persecute us. The verb tense here suggests that this isn't pray for, prayer for those who have persecuted us or for those who will persecute us. The action is ongoing right now. You are to pray for our persecutors in the midst of persecution. Now here in America, we don't experience persecution like our brothers and sisters in other countries. Though I fear that the time is coming in our nation when we too will be called upon to suffer for the sake of Christ. And when that time comes, we're not to pray against our persecutors. We're to pray for them. We're not to pray that they will, we are to pray that they will come to a knowledge of Jesus, the Son of God, as Savior and Lord. We're to pray that God will work in their lives in such a way as to lead them to him. Gina Fadley, uh, Director of Youth with Mission Frontier Missions, Inc., YWAM, as you might know it, uh, said during an uh, appearance on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network some time ago, she said, one of our YWAM workers in the Middle East was contacted by a friend earlier this year. And they met up and he was introduced to an ISIS fighter who had killed many Christians already. I mean, that's a horrible situation. In the Middle East, he was probably on guard. Fadley, who appeared in the Voice of the Martyrs, Voice of the Martyrs Radio Program, along with Kevin Sutter, another YWAM leader, went on to share that this Islamic State jihadi confessed not only to killing Christians, but that he had actually enjoyed doing so. He told this Huawei leader that he had begun having dreams of this man in white who came to him and said, you are killing my people. And he started to feel really sick and uneasy about what he was doing, Fadley continued. The fighter said, just before he killed one Christian, the man said, I know you will kill me, but I give to you my Bible. The Christian was killed, and the, this ISIS fighter actually took the Bible and began to read it. In another dream, Jesus asked him to follow him, and he was now asking to become a follower of Christ and to be discipled. Prayer is powerful. And we're to pray for those who persecute us, and we're to love our enemies. Luke adds this, uh, adds this in his version, found in Luke 6, 27-28. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. It's important that we hear what Jesus is saying to us. And Matthew 5.45 tells us why. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. When we act according to the righteousness of God, we show ourselves to be sons of God. Not just children. The word here implies growth is occurring. In fact, this verse could be understood as with the result that you may become sons. As we grow up, we can often resemble our parents, right? Whether it be in how we look, some mannerism, some way of acting, some way of speaking. 
have you ever said something and thought to yourself, I sound just like mom or, or watch yourself on video and say, you see yourself looking like your dad. It's natural that we resemble our parents. And the same is true spiritually. We are to reflect the character of God, who is our Heavenly Father, who loves without partiality. God's Son rises at His command and gives light, gives a light to evil and good alike. The rains come as God wishes and waters the fields of the righteous and the unrighteous alike. If God's character shows such grace, we too ought to show grace. If God loves in such a way, we too ought to love as God loves. Verses 46 and 47 continue with this thought. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? See, for the Jews, no one was more despised than a tax collector. They were viewed as traitors, sellouts. They served the Roman Empire for their own profit, and they charged their own people in excess to make more money. And yet, Jesus calls those who might think that they're acting righteously when, the love, when they love others, who love them by comparing them to those that they despised. The same thing applies to the Gentiles. Many Jews did not want to give the standard greeting of shalom to those they viewed as enemies. Shalom means peace. It carries the idea of, may everything go well with you. They didn't want their enemies to do well. But some Gentiles acted the same way. The Greek greeting kairain meant joy be to you, and was withheld from those deemed unworthy. To withhold a greeting was to act just like the pagans. True righteousness is not partial. For believers, to be righteous in our relationship is to be like our Father in heaven. And then Jesus, this is Jesus' command to us. Verse 48, Therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. This perfection speaks to moral character. This is not perfection as the world describes it, but as God the Father does. Peter writes about it this way, putting it in terms of holiness, over in 1 Peter 1, 13-16. Therefore, he writes, prepare your minds for action, keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves." Also in your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Peter quoted Leviticus here. In that phrase, that idea is found in several places in Leviticus, including chapter 19, where our command to love our neighbor is found. To be perfect means to settle our minds on the holiness of God and to emulate our Father, to act like Him. We are to look to His character to inform our own. We don't set the standards of righteousness that we live by, by the world, by rules, uh, by our own selves. Instead, we must understand that true righteousness flows from a relationship with the Heavenly Father. And Jesus calls us to show this righteousness in our lives, especially when we face opposition. First, by choosing grace over retaliation and by choosing to love over hate. So, believer. Does your character match up to God's? Are you growing more Christ-like every day? When you face opposition, is your reaction, does your reaction flow from pride, or do you exhibit a humility like that of Jesus? Let your relationship with God be what motivates you, and act like your Heavenly Father. Now, friend, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you, you do not have a relationship with God the Father. And without that relationship, you cannot please Him. Without that relationship, you're destined for an eternity separated from Him in a place of torment. But God doesn't want you to stay separated from Him. He wants, to be in a, he wants you to be in relationship with Him. He loves you right now. Even though your sins separate you from Him and make you His enemy, He loves you so much that He sent His Son, Jesus, to bear the penalty for your sins. That penalty is death. Jesus died for you, and he rose from the dead to extend to you forgiveness and eternal life. And he calls for you to receive him. So turn from your sins, turn from your way of doing things, and turn to him. Seek his forgiveness, and he will give you new life. A life that is in relationship 
to, with God the Father. And he will empower you to live for him. And he will transform you to reflect the very character of God. Trust in Jesus. Only he can redeem you and transform you. Only he can save you. Grace over retaliation. And love over hate.